So this is part two of our talk on Jesus saying that he was the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. If you didn't get a chance to watch part one, please go back and do that because we just set a table where we, I think, um, addressed some of the controversy around this often misused and misinterpreted verse. So let me say one more thing before we go on um, with the rest of this, uh, this passage. I think part of what confuses us here is Jesus's use of the word father. Because if he says God is his father, then the implication then is that he himself is the son. And I think the father-son analogy doesn't necessarily help us a lot in this particular situation. We take our understanding of what a father and son relationship is, and we superimpose it on the relationship between Jesus and God. Example, um, we were at a family get-together. Um, we were seeing people that hadn't seen my husband in a long time. They hadn't seen him since he was a boy. And so they remembered him as being a little guy. They remembered his dad as being a middle-aged guy with bright blue eyes and dark hair. So we got together. People saw my husband. And there were people who, for a split second, before their logic brain kicked in, for a split second, they saw my middle-aged husband, and they thought that he was his dad. And then they went, oh, wait, no. Okay, too many years have passed. Clearly, you're not the little guy anymore. You're, you're now the middle-aged man. <laughs> but they knew immediately who he was because he looked so much like his dad had looked 30 years earlier. His dad still has the brilliant blue eyes. He's a silver fox now. The dark hair is gone. But there's a strong resemblance because when you look at one, you know the other. Kind of. When you look at my hus husband, you can see what his dad must have looked like 30 years earlier. But the thing is, my husband and his dad are two different people. They aren't exactly the same. And there are times where my husband makes decisions and does things in a certain way that his dad wouldn't do. He uses certain words that maybe his dad wouldn't use. He looks at life in a way that maybe his dad wouldn't look at it. So while there's a strong resemblance, they are two different people. That is not what's happening with Jesus and God. This is a different kind of relationship because Jesus is God. Jesus is fully human and fully divine. Jesus is God in the flesh. If you want to know who God is, look to Jesus because Jesus is the perfect representation of God. Jesus is God's own self. And so when we get caught up in this uh, father and son type of analogy, we tend to see Jesus sometimes as like this middleman between us and God. Jesus is like this person that you have to satisfy first. And if you can meet all his requirements and jump through all his hoops, then he'll put you in the car and he'll drive you to the undisclosed location where his father is waiting. That's not who Jesus is. Jesus is not a barrier to God. Jesus is not guarding the gate to keep the people who don't really believe properly away from God. Jesus is God. So when he says no one comes to the Father except through me, he couldn't be saying that you have to get through me before you can get to the Father. Because that would be like saying you have to get through me before you can get to me. That doesn't make any sense. So when Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through me, we have to remember he and the Father are one. They are the same. And that's why he says, if you know me, then you know the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We are the same. It changes the whole outlook, doesn't it? that people on faith journeys that don't look exactly like ours are still seeing God at work, whether they know it or not, whether they understand the force that's at play, the beauty in the world, the redemption, the love, the kindness, the goodness, the glimpses that they have seen, the glimpses that you and I have seen, is God at work. 
And why are we able to see it? Why are we drawn in to investigate more and to know more? Because God's grace compels us. The gospel is compelling. And the, the disciples in this passage, Thomas and Philip, they are great examples of that. You know, they were average guys. They were nobody special. They spent all this time with Jesus. And yet, Thomas was still trying to ask practical questions. Jesus is saying, you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas is like, we don't, we don't. We don't even know where you're going. How could we know the way? You know, does anybody have some scroll and a, a quill? Maybe Jesus could write down the address for us and we'll try and catch up with you later. And then Jesus says more spiritual things. It's not practical at all. I'm in the Father. The Father's in me. And I'm sure they're like, oh, okay, well, that clears that up. <laughs> and then Philip jumps in and he's like, okay, so can you just show us the Father? Is he here somewhere where we could talk to him? And Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We are one and the same. They saw glimpses of God at work. They didn't realize they were seeing God all the time. But Jesus says, if you can't believe that, then at least believe because of what you have seen me do. You have seen the miraculous. You have seen glimpses of God's beauty and goodness. And haven't we seen a glimpse here and there ourselves? I mean, if you're watching this video, if you bothered to go to part two for crying out loud, you've seen something that compels you. You've seen something that's made you go, hmm, I can't really explain that. I can't give you a logical explanation. I can't prove it scientifically. But there's something happening. There's something supernatural. There's something that compels me, something that's pulling me closer, something that makes me want to know more about this Jesus that makes me want to understand more about what this God is all about. Thomas and Philip, regular guys, just like you and I. And yet their lives were transformed by knowing Jesus. The world then was transformed because of them and their, their fellow disciples. After Jesus left the earth, the gospel was either going to live or die with the disciples. And the disciples committed hard to making sure that the good news of the gospel was preached. Thomas was martyred for his faith. Church history tells us that he actually left the Roman Empire after Jesus was gone. He left the Roman Empire. He became a missionary to what's now um, India. And he was martyred there for his faith preaching the good news of the gospel. Philip was also martyred for his faith. Um, Christian tradition suggests that he was eventually crucified and that as he hung on his cross, he continued to preach the good news of Christ. That, <laughs> that's compelling stuff. That's someone who saw something. I can't explain to you it in words. I can't explain to you how it is that one can be fully flesh and fully divine. I can't explain to you how Jesus is the Father and the Father is Jesus and they are one. And if I remain in Jesus, that Jesus will remain in me and we can have the same level of intimacy that Jesus and the Father have. I don't understand how all that works. That's a mystery. And I don't know that Thomas and I don't know that Philip could explain how it worked either, but they knew it was true. Because Jesus had taught them. Jesus was with them. And Jesus showed them that he is the way and the truth and the life. And when things are difficult and when you're being persecuted for your faith, hold fast, hold tight, hold on to what you've seen in me. Because it was true. And it is still true. And it will continue to be true. That's good news for you and me. Because we experience challenges. We see things that we can't explain. We're tempted to discount it because we can't, we can't give it proof and we can't give it evidence sometimes. And yet we know that we know. We know what we saw. 
we know that in the situation that we saw that God was at work, that there was goodness, that there was redemption, or there was beauty going on, we've seen glimpses of it. And to us, Christ says, hold fast, hold tight to those experiences, to those little moments, because they were right. They were good. They were true. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and I am drawing you closer. Come closer to me. It's good news for us. It's also good news for all of creation. The Apostle Paul talks about how all of creation is groaning as in the pangs of childbirth. They are waiting to see God revealed to them. And God makes God's own self known in the world, often through others, through you and through me. When we are living in such a way that we are connected to the vine, when we are living in such a way that there is redemption and there is love in the world around us, because we have put it there, because God has put it there through us. That's good news for the rest of the world. That's good news for others. It's good news for creation. May creation and all those around us know and be drawn in to the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. May our desire to know something deeper, to experience something more, to see glimpses of the divine, may those be brought to pass because we have remained in Christ, because Christ remains in us, and because Christ draws us ever closer. May you be that person in the world this week who lives a life of faith that's so compelling that it brings hope and peace and joy to someone else. As Christ has loved you, may you love others. And may the world and all of creation be different because the way and the truth and the life is living and working in and through and among us. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you, both now and forevermore. Amen.